This has been a big year for Mars exploration. In the space of just two weeks, we saw no less than three rocket launches bound for the red planet. First was the Hope Orbiter. Launched by the United Arab Emirates, Hope instantly turned the UAE into a major player in off-world exploration. Less than a week later, TN-11 blasted off to become China's first interplanetary mission. Not to be outdone, NASA then launched its Perseverance rover and a small helicopter called Ingenuity that it hopes to fly around on Mars. Emily Lakdawalla is a solar system expert and science author, most recently with the Planetary Society. What better topic right now than Mars? We have had three missions launched to Mars this summer. It's definitely going to be a busy next year in February when they all get there. So I wanted to just start by taking the kind of broad view on this. We've had a lot of success studying Mars over the last couple of decades. What is still to learn and with each of these missions, what is their focus? Well, it's a really interesting time in Mars exploration because like you said, it's been a very successful couple of decades. Ever since about 1996, there's been a large number of spacecraft sent to Mars and they actually have kind of accomplished this big arc of exploration that they were sent to Mars to do. We had Mars Global Surveyor, surveyed Mars, got topographic maps, and then every mission since then has kind of added on to it and really made uh, uh, proved that Mars used to have liquid water running across its surface and even had environments that could once have supported life. What's being sent to Mars now is really kind of the next step um, in terms of the, the NASA and ESA exploration, the next step in the exploration of Mars, which is to begin the process of getting samples back to Earth. And that's what the Perseverance rover is designed to do. It's not gonna bring the samples back, but it's gonna identify, drill, and cache them for a future mission to return. Really, the goal of this mission is to identify a really good set of samples to bring back. They're going to this particular crater because it used to have a lake in it, it's pretty obvious that it used to have a lake in it because it has a huge delta that was clearly built out into still water into this ancient lake. And so Perseverance will be landing in the floor of the crater at the toe of the delta, which is where the river you know, dumped its very finest sediments. And that's beautiful environment for preserving all kinds of stuff about the ancient environment. And if we're super lucky, ancient microorganisms. What's the likelihood that you could have anything that really uh, looks like some kind of microfossil in that in that delta. I think the answer to that question is yes, it could under very specific conditions if the fossils were big enough and if they were super obvious. But even then, I think no good scientist would say that the existence of life on Mars was proven just based on you know one high resolution camera image of this one spot. You really have to have multiple instruments brought to bear. And more importantly, you have to have a lot of different teams of scientists get to look at the same samples and actually come to some kind of consensus. As this mission, this kind of mission arc continues uh, and we hopefully get these samples back to Earth. I wanted to just address the whole planetary protection concerns. Say that it is what would be the most exciting thing. There are some signs of life in there. What do we do to make sure that we don't end up with a bunch of Martians exploding in the atmosphere or something like that? How does the planetary protection side of it come into all of this? Yeah, we want to avoid the Andromeda strain. It's growing. There's another direction for contamination that I'm particularly worried about, and that's forward contamination. That's bringing Earth microbes to Mars and potentially contaminating Mars with Earth life before we have a chance to really settle the question of if we can find life on Mars or not. And fortunately, this is something that, that um, NASA and ESA are very concerned about, and they work very hard on making sure that this, any spacecraft that lands on Mars is as sterile as it can possibly be. How is that going to play out as we try to get humans on Mars? Obviously, putting the human in the clean room and trying to sterilize them is not going to be great. So what's the plan for when we want to really start getting boots on the ground on, on Mars? Yeah, so once you have a human land on the surface of Mars, it's kind of game over as far as planetary protection is concerned. Because like you point out, you cannot sterilize uh, the human. I mean, even if you could bake the human, let's say you could. I mean, there's there's just so many microorganisms that live in us and on us, and we depend on them to digest our food. And, you know, there's no way to keep 
um, like every a genus of Earth life from, from uh, coming along to Mars with us. So one of the reasons why it's important to send Perseverance now, even though we haven't developed the return part of the mission yet, is to make sure we get some samples in hermetically sealed containers before humans ever touch down on the surface of Mars. What's happening on Mars this year is that the of the three spacecraft that are headed toward Mars, two of them are from countries that have not explored Mars in the past. We have China has an orbiter and a lander and a rover, and then United Arab Emirates has this orbiter. And so we're going to see more and more different entities um, spreading out into space and having a lot more opportunities for exploration and science. So I'm really looking forward to that. Could you get into a little bit about what uh, China's mission, you mentioned it has an orbiter, a lander, and, and a rover. Uh, what are some of the goals of that mission? Well, the, uh, China's mission is really designed to be its first great Mars mission. If successful, it will be their first ever landing on Mars. Um, if, it will be the first ever successful landing on Mars by anybody other than NASA if they succeed. It's a really difficult thing to land on Mars. And so, um, you know, generally speaking, countries are not successful on their first Mars landing try. But that was also true for the moon, and uh, China succeeded swimmingly with two lunar landing missions, so they've demonstrated their capability. The United Arab Emirates mission is quite different. It's a very focused orbiter that's focused on weather, and it's going to slot right in to the set of international missions that is already at Mars and help provide some more global context. So it's going to be a lot like a weather satellite, like one of our, it won't be geostationary like the weather satellites we have on Earth, but it will help provide the global context to the very detailed kind of stuff that the current NASA and ESA spacecraft are capable of. It's fitting, you know, they've hired a lot of talent and, and, uh, and a lot of capability from all over the world to help rapidly build up their capability in this sector. And they, um, they are very explicit about their goal being to develop from, a, from an oil economy to an information and, you know, engineering economy. And they also talk a lot about how um, important it is, given how young their population is, to inspire their young people toward high-tech careers so that they build a non-oil-based economy for the future. So the goals of that mission are as much for inspiration and kind of local, you know, in-country development as it is for uh, the scientific goals or the international prestige. Do you have some dream kind of missions for uh, stuff outside of Mars? What, where's the place that you would just be dying to go next, you know? <laughs> Well, I desperately want a pair of orbiters, twins, please, to explore Uranus and Neptune because we have not visited and orbited a, uh, an ice giant. Those planets are very different from Jupiter and Saturn. Internally, they're very different. They have very different magnetic fields. They have very different ring systems. And they have super cool moons, and I really love the moons. At Uranus, we have a set of icy moons, sort of like the ones at Saturn, but they have their own personalities. And they're named after characters from A Midsummer Night's Dream. So you've got Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon, and Puck orbiting Uranus, which would just be, I mean, just imagine the teaching crossover stuff you could do with that. And then Neptune has uh, fewer moons. Um, it's only got one really big one, but that one, it's a great moon. It's called Triton, and it's probably a captured Kuiper Belt object. It's larger than Pluto, and it's got nitrogen geysers shooting up from its surface, and it would just be amazing to be able to study that in place. But then I also want to go back to Venus and get better images of Venus and see if it's got active geology, and I want to get down to the surface and see what its rocks are made of and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, Venus and Uranus and Neptune, that's all I want. Yeah. 